We are now in the Gospel of Mark. Excuse me, I jumped ahead a little bit. Now, last week, uh, we covered verses, uh, Mark chapter 3, verses 1 to 15, and we saw Jesus. And Jesus, if you remember, he's forgiving people, he's healing people, and uh, he's teaching the word of God wherever he goes. And, and he went into a synagogue, if you remember, in Capernaum, right? And unfortunately, the religious leaders of that day were very critical. They were very judgy, and they were looking for the reason. And the enemy's always working in people's head. And the Pharisees, unfortunately, were doing that with Jesus. And, and they, they, they knew that there was a man with a shriveled hand there, and they were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. And that word in Greek means they were looking with evil intent. <laughs> I'm going to find something wrong with you. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, I did. <laughs> and anyways, so that's why it's so important for us to guard our heart. Let me tell you, I, the enemy is always trying to work in our hearts and minds to poison it. Get you thinking bad about you and about you, and about you, and me, and them, and us, and the church, and Jesus, and that's how he works. We have to guard our heart, because the enemy is always working, and remember that everything that comes from our heart, we have to deal with those heart motives. Those Pharisees didn't do that, and, the, and those religious leaders, what you say and what you do all flows from the heart, and Jesus said to that man with the shriveled hand in that synagogue, he said, I want you to stand up in front of everybody, and, and he rebuked them, he, these Pharisees, he said, hey, they, they were like, is he going to heal on the Sabbath day? Is he going to do something good? And Jesus was like, hey, w- which is lawful, to do good or to evil on the Sabbath, to, to save a life or to kill? And we talked about sins of commission and omission. And, and Jesus looked at those Pharisees with anger. And we talked about you know, being angry and not sinning. And he was deeply distressed. And he told that guy to stretch forth his hand, an impossible command. And you guys have been given impossible commands too. But yet at his word, he did it. And if you remember, it was completely restored. And we talked about not sinning in our anger and whatnot. And then Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the lake, the sea around the Sea of Galilee. And a large crowd from Galilee followed. And when they heard about all that he was doing, many people came from all over, Judea, Jerusalem, Idumea, and the regions across the Jordan, and from around Tyre and Sidon, so much so that because of that crowd, he had to get on a boat and to stop the people. They were just trying to touch him. And he would, even when he would teach or when he would preach or when he would drive out demons, he would give them orders because they would say, hey, you're the son of God. He told them not to do that because it was a time and a place. And lastly, Jesus went up on a mountain size in, in Mark chapter 3, verses 13 to 15, and he called those that he wanted, and they came to him. And can I tell you, he's done that to you. He's called you, and there's the responsibility. You have to come to him, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and he will give you rest. He said, take my yoke upon yourselves and learn from me. I'm gentle and humble in heart. And it says, he appointed those 12 that they might be with him and that they might send them out to preach or teach and even have authority to drive out demons. And so we have to remember that he has called us in that same way with the riches of his glory and inheritance. And all those who actually come to Jesus, he will never drive away. And how, how do you know what never means in the Greek? It means never. It's not complicated. He will never drive away if you come to him. And then it says in John 15, 5, that you didn't choose me. I chose you and appointed you to go bear fruit of the Holy Spirit, fruit that will last. That's why he's chosen you, Joe. That's why he's chosen you. And that's why he's chosen me. And that's where we left off. So we start off in Mark chapter 3, verses 16 to 19. So give me one second. The only negative with writing a lot in your book is that sometimes you run out of room. I have a cheap $7 Bible that I bought a long time ago, but it's everything God has ever spoken to me, and so I have a hard time buying fancy new ones with margins and all that stuff. So um, give me a second. I'm just going to read. All right. It starts off. Mark chapter 3, starting in verse 16. It says, These are the twelve he appointed. Simon to whom he gave the name Peter, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. To them he gave the name Bonerges, which means sons of thunder. 
It says, Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Now, uh, this list that you see here, uh, I'll, I'll put it up on the screen so you can watch and see as well. This list that you see here in Mark's gospel, 3, 16, and 19, is also found in Matthew's gospel. It's also found in Luke's gospel. It's found in one more place uh, in, in, in Acts. And uh, in all those places, it always starts first with Simon Peter. And I think because he was the, kind of the, the loudest and the, you know, uh, he came first with the... Well, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me just be quiet. I've got to hold off because I've got a little order of things that I have in my mind. And then uh, lastly is always Judas Iscariot who betrayed him. And I say always, except in the book of Acts, when, when it lists uh, the apostles, Judas Iscariot is not listed last because he had already committed suicide uh, for what he had done. Now, there's something in Mark's gospel. Remember, Mark's a very short-pointed gospel, right? It's like doop, doop. Bullet point, boom, 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 boom. And I like that. For an ADD guy like me, I love it. One after another, hits you, hits you, hits you. But sometimes it lacks some of the details that some of the other gospels, like a Luke or a Matthew that's a lot longer, uh, goes into. And one of the details, it says, it, it just sounds like, oh, he just went up in a mountainside and said, hey, you know what? Hey, you look good. I'm choosing you. Oh, I like you. You're loud. I like you. You dress nice. I, I like you because, you know, the green shirt. It, what, whatever it is, but it doesn't say that. Luke adds another little facet to this that I want us to be aware of. Luke chapter 6, verse 12, uh, in describing the same event, has one extra verse that, that, that says a lot. It says, when Jesus went up on that mountaintop, he first went up and he prayed. And it says that he prayed to God all night. And... and and I think that was done as he's seeking uh, God the Father and he's praying and asking. I don't think it was done oh, who was the richest, who was the coolest, who was the loudest, who was the... What he did was he prayed continually and he asked God the Father for instructions, who he should choose, what he should do next. And you know what? That's a great example for us. You know what? We should be praying about everything so here's a question you have to ask in your life. Is prayer the steering wheel of your life or is prayer the spare tire? Do you know what I'm saying? Like when you get a flat, it's like, oh, yeah, now, now I'm going to pray. Now, now I'm going to bring out that spare prayer tire and now I'll do it because now I have to. Or is prayer the steering wheel that's taking you where you want to go in your decisions, whether it's at work, whether it's with your family, whether it's at the job, at, the, at school, wherever it is, every decision you make. And, and Jesus prayed to God. It says he prayed all night. You know, so I, I'm having this, I, I, got, I got problems. You know. So one of the problems I have is for some reason, I'm waking up in the middle of the night. I don't, I don't know... What that is, it's probably because of my youthfulness. But whatever the reason, I'm waking up in the middle of the night. Now, can I tell you? I don't want to wake up in the middle of the night. I want to be sleepy. I want to have my head on that little pillow and get lots of rest. And sometimes it's like, bing, my eyes are open. And you know what I have started doing? Instead of just wasting my time or getting angry and frustrated, and I start praying for people. I start saying, Lord, who do you want me to pray for? Yeah. Kind of like Samuel. Samuel. Oh, yeah. Huh. Yeah, Lord. Hey, who do you want me to pray for? If you, know, you know what? Next time you're up and you're instead of getting mad or getting angry, God, why am I? Blah, 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 start ask him, Lord, is there someone you want me to pray for? Now, maybe there isn't. Maybe you're up because you had the bad pizza or you had the caffeine, a cup of coffee too late, whatever it is. Or maybe he's waking you up and he wants you to pray. Maybe he wants to pray for protection over your family and your kids. Maybe he wants you to, to pray for the decision that you're making or friends or people here in the church. Pray, ask God, do warfare. And, and, and if you need help, this is God's phone number. You've got it. It's a hotline. 
Jeremiah 33, 3 says, call to me and I will answer you and tell you great and searchable things that you do not know. I love that even in... Uh, uh, even in 1 Timothy 2.1, it actually, the little title, if you have that in your Bible, it says instructions to, on worship, but it's talking about prayer. And it says, I urge you, this is Paul writing to Timothy, I urge you f- then, first of all, or of utmost importance, he would say to us, he was saying to Timothy, and, and God would say to us, he goes, I, 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 first of all, that petitions, Prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving petitions are just requests to God. Prayers, Lord, strengthen this people. Help intercession. Lord, I want to take hits for this person. They're going through it. I'm praying that for their protection. I, Lord, even, even take that. I'll even take some of the hits that they're taking, Lord. I, I'm praying that. And Lord, thank you for all things, Lord. You've given me life, breath, another day to live. Thank you, Lord. We'll be made for all people. And so God wants us praying continually. And, and, and when I think about this motley bunch, I, I think to myself, it's not somebody that most churches today or leaders today would choose. Do you know how people choose? Oh, no, no, it's not me not to say that. <sighs> Sometimes people choose their leaders or they choose their followers, and, and, and well, who, who brings in the biggest tithe? Oh, that's why I want this church. Oh, oh, oh you tithe a lot? Oh, you, you come, you get the nice fancy seat. In fact, we'll put your name on it. Or, or maybe if you're really popular, oh, we want, we want to put you up in front of everybody so that they can see, you know. Or we want to put you in charge of something because you're hip, cool, pop, whatever it is. Or you're charismatic. Or they don't want to you, you know what? God wants you to have people of character. And, and you know what? And some of you will be thinking, well, I, I don't have character. He called me. He chose me. I, I feel like a loser. Anybody here? I'll just raise my hand. Okay, you don't have to. And I think, what do you do? But he did. And he sees something in me that maybe even I don't see. And I say, thank you, Lord. And he who began a good work in me is faithful to complete it into the day of Christ Jesus. And I might not see the tapestry or the painting or the sculpture that he's doing because he sees the finished work. I just sort of see a Picasso. But he does. Now, when I look at these disciples, they... I I, I picture Jesus like with a selfie, like, hey, yo, peace out, you know. And, And I picture... This, uh, not many of them were influential or, or popular or, 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 you know, places of authority and stuff. And, and honestly, neither of, uh, were you when God called you. Isn't it true? I mean, hey, you know, you know what? Maybe there is a prince here. Maybe there is an Elon Musk here. Maybe there is, it, if there is, you guys should be tithing more because <laughs> anyway... Maybe there is, you know, there's a rock star here. I don't know about it, okay? You know, and if so, God loves you just as much as everybody else. But brothers and sisters, 1 Corinthians 1, 26, 27 says, brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. He says, not many of you were wise by human standards, right? Not many of you were influential. Not many of you were of noble birth, but God chose the foolish things of the world. At least you can give me water. To shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. Now, when I got saved, I'm going to tell you embarrassing things about myself. People are like, no, do that. It makes you look bad. No, I think it makes me look real. Okay. And if some people think it, that's, that's on you. But, but I, when I first got saved, I thought pretty highly of myself, let's just say. I was at my peak of my physical appearance, lived on the beach, drove my convertible, in shape, little popular, little rock star. So I thought when I got saved, you know, thank you. Uh, Remember, this is what I thought. I don't think this now, okay? I thought, oh, God, you got a rock star. You know, I'm going places. I'm smart. I can, I can. Now, you got all these, you know, 
stragglers and stuff. Now you got somebody you can really use. I actually thought this. I'm not kidding you. I thought, wow, you got a good one now, Lord. <laughs> Little, of course, you guys who are saved, some of you laugh because you know, of course, what the Lord had to do was deconstruct all that I placed value in, all that made me cool, popular, whatever I thought I was, can I just tell you, I was nothing. And the Lord is so faithful because when we're weak, we're strong. I used to, I would think I could do this up here in my sleep. Now I think every week, I can't do it, Lord. And he somehow comes through again and gives you a teaching because he loves you. Isn't that amazing? That's our God. But he does something. He changes lives of common people like you and me. We're ordinary folk here. But he changes lives. And when God changes a heart supernaturally by the regeneration of the Holy Spirit in our lives, it changes our thoughts, how we do things, how we think of things. Everything starts to change. And I'm not talking about religion. You know that can go astray, right? I'm talking about our hearts our hearts are really deceitfully wicked. And, and, and it's, I, oh, sorry, I'm jumping ahead. Sorry, I don't know how, somehow it jumped way ahead. And I don't know how it did that. So give me just a second. There we go. Almost there. There it is. But Jesus brings hearts back to life. We all have a sinful, tainted, selfish, self-centered heart, Right? And, and, and it says that these common, ordinary people that God did a work in because they had been with Jesus. There was a time in the book of Acts, it says in Acts chapter 4, verse 13, where Peter and John were, were brought before the, the leaders. They were taken captive, and they were, they were just preaching and teaching the love of God, and, and they were taken, and, and, and they were brought before them, and, and, and why, why are you preaching and teaching about Jesus? What are you doing? And, and, and when they saw these sand, the, all these religious leaders, the whole Jewish community, well-taught, learned, powerful, influential men, when they saw the courage of Peter and John, blue-collar workers like us, fishermen, okay? When they saw the courage of Peter and John, it says they realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men like you, like me. And they were astonished. They were blown away. What? You haven't been to seminary. You haven't been. And it says, and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Being with Jesus makes a change in your life. Some of you have grown a little stagnant. And you know who you are. We'll get a microphone ready for you. Thank you, Lester. I don't know who has the microphone. Thank you. But they were astonished. They recognized that being with Jesus made a difference. It made a change in how they thought, how they acted. A new life was flowing from them. Goodness, love, joy that went beyond the religion, that went beyond the criticalness of the Pharisees. A blessing to other people. Others-centered, not self-centered. And the same will happen to you if you take time with Jesus daily. And if your heart's grown hard, if you've become a little stagnant, if you maybe have feel like you're running on fumes, you know, go back to the Lord. Listen to a teaching. If you don't know what to listen to, send me something. And I'll send you good teachers to listen to. Uh, take, I'll give you a devotional. We'll give you a free Bible. We'll give you some videos to listen to. Yeah, what, what were you watching? Was it uh, the Chosen series? Okay, they take creative liberties. We, was that on our Netflix? Was that on? We was watching, Lisa had it on. It was really beautiful. Again, some creative liberties, okay? So I could get critical and say, wait a minute, I don't remember that. But the heart, really, they got a lot of it right. It was beautiful. I was walking by as I was studying a couple times. It was like almost brought to tears. But they took note that these men had been with Jesus. You have a question or comment? So. Comment. Verse 14, it says, He ordained 
12. Notice the first reason why he chose those 12 in verse 14. That they should be with him. That is reason number one. That they should be with him. And that's the same for each and every one of us. He wants us with him. And then the changes take place inside of us. Yeah, that's excellent. Good. That's really a good word. There. Would you read the rest of that verse? Because the, the one that goes right with it is our next command. Where it says that he might send. Yeah. And we'll get to that in a minute. But the main point, though, is what you just said. He wanted him to be with him. And he wants to be with you, too. And our flesh, can I tell you something? There's something weird and self-centered in our flesh, and the enemy is always right there to oblige. Uh, He doesn't want you spending time with the Lord. He doesn't want you spending time in the Word. He doesn't want you watching things that will help you grow. Isn't it true? Isn't it? And we have to combat against that. And even though these guys are a weird, misfit group of guys, kind of like us, I would never have got to know Sarah and what a blessing she is if it wasn't for the Lord. I wouldn't have got to know Natalie or Stan or Mark or Laura. Dave, I wouldn't have known you guys if it wasn't for Jesus. But because of that, I'm so thankful for you. I'm so thankful that you're part of this church. I really am. Thank you, Jesus. These guys, although the seemingly little mishmash of people... It says, if you remember in Revelation 21, at the end of Revelation, the new heavenly Jerusalem, it says, the wall of the city, it said, had 12 foundations. Now you can't even see it's a laser now. It's so bright in the screen. And on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Right there on the foundations of the wall of the city. And so when we look at these guys, we see the 12 he appointed. We see Simon, who he gave the name Peter. Simon, I, I, I... I feel like I'm like him sometimes. I'm really zealous, but sometimes in my zeal, I I say the wrong things. I don't mean to say the wrong things. I I just get, and I stick my foot in my mouth. And I'm like, oh, I I didn't mean it. Or I didn't mean it like that. No, 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 no. And then I start trying to dig myself out of it. And I dig the hole deeper. Do you know what I'm saying? Peter, the, the, the. I'll never deny you, Lord. All these others, well, I'll stand strong. <sighs> Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter. James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John's. Again, these guys were, were fishermen. They, uh, he, he gave them the name Bonerges, which means sons of thunder. And, and, and these guys are, are the same. John is known as the disciple of love, right? But did you know in the early years, do you know what he was doing? When, when they were going to Jerusalem and, and going through Samaria and, and they, they went ahead to prepare the way for Jesus and, 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 and they're like, oh, no, we don't want you Jews here. There's a lot of racism back and forth against the Jews, kind of like now, and, and, but also against the Samaritans too. And, and, and he's like, we don't want your type here. We don't want you here. Jesus and, and James and John are like, Lord, you want us to call fire down from heaven and burn them all? Jesus is like, he, uh, he said, dude. But he didn't say dude, but that's, that's my paraphrase. He's like, you don't even know what spirit you're under when you're talking like that. You want me to burn these guys? No. But, but in the early, this is what they were like. You, you see, Andrew, right? Peter's brother. You see, Philip. Philip was the one that he got, he got saved. And, and Well, first, Andrew. I mean, he got, he, when Jesus called Peter and Andrew, he's like, hey, I'm going to make you fishers of men. And then Philip. Philip is the one that got Bartholomew. He's also known as Nathaniel. And, and he's like, I, I, I brought, I, I'm going to bring people to you, Lord. And, 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 and Philip is the one to say, hey, Jesus, just show us the Father, and that'll be enough. And he's like, Philip, haven't I been with you so long? What do you mean, show us the Father? You've seen me. You've seen the Father, 
right? Philip, come on. You see Bartholomew or Nathaniel, that's the one he went and got. And Nathaniel's like, oh, can anything good come out of Nazareth? That's what he said about Jesus. And then he's like, Jesus is like, hey, I remember seeing you when you, I saw you when you were under the fig tree all by yourself. Maybe he was crying out to the Lord. He's like, oh, you are the Messiah. And, and, and he got saved. Matthew, otherwise known as Levi, the tax collector, hated amongst the Jews, uh, a co-conspirator with the Romans, uh, an outcast, a, a sellout, a compromiser, like some of us. He was saved. Thomas, the doubter, remember? The first time Jesus came back, everybody's like, oh, wow. And he's, they're like, Thomas, you're not going to believe it. Jesus is resurrected from the dead. He's like, I'm not going to believe it unless I, you know, <laughs> I'm going to put my little fingers in the little holes in his hand, okay? <laughs> then I'll believe. And Jesus is like, shows up again, hey, here you go. And then that same Thomas is like, oh, my Lord, my God. Thomas. James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, even pairing people together. You got Simon the Zealot, a religious extremist, and you got Matthew, the co-conspirator. They're opposites. Some of you, oh, I just don't like this person. I like this person. Well, can I tell you, we're all one in Christ Jesus. Learn to get along. I don't want to go to that church because there's people who wear hats there or have blue hair there or wear jackets, or whatever it is. So what? Who cares? Learn to love one another. Jesus did that. And so, he, hey, can I tell you something? All these people, for those of you who don't know, I know I'm taking a little bit too much time on this, but they were all, they all gave their lives to Jesus. These nobodies, these common people, just tell you, I wrote it down so I wouldn't forget. Peter crucified upside down in Rome. James, son of Zebedee, in Acts chapter 12, verse 2, said that he was killed with the sword by Herod, probably beheaded, I would say. I can't tell you that for sure. But John, he was exiled to Patmos, to a penal colony in the mines, eventually died of old age in Ephesus. But Andrew, it says, according to tradition at least, he was crucified in an X-shaped cross in Greece. Philip, I'm not sure about, but I think he was hung on iron hooks. Bartholomew or Nathaniel, he was flayed to death with a, with a whip with bone in it. And it shredded his skin until he died for his faith. In Turkey, Matthew by the, the sword, Thomas by the spear as a missionary in India, um, and, the, and the list goes on and on. I think, I think Thaddeus and... And Simon, I think the zealot were, were crucified. The point is that all these people gave their lives for Jesus Christ. And then there's Judas who betrayed him. You know? And, and, and he turns ordinary people like you and me into extraordinary. And, and when you ask who's the minister of this church, Jim with Chosen People Minister came here. He said, he, I don't know if you remember this, but it was very important. He said, you know who the ministers are of this church? Pastor Gary's on vacation this week. It's not Pastor Gary. It's not Pastor Darren. It's you. You are the ministers of this church. You are actually the ministers of his church. The church is not the building. The church is you. You're the ministers. You're the servants. My job is, like Ephesians says, is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. You are actually his ambassadors. Isn't that amazing? So I want you to remember that. So who are the ministers of the church? You. Never forget that. He's chosen you. Goes on to say in Mark 3, 20 and 22, I'm going to hurry it up a little bit because I realize I just spent a lot of time there. Then Jesus entered a house and again the crowds gathered so that he and his disciples weren't even able to eat. It said when his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him and said, hey, he's out of his mind. He's not even eating. He's ministering so much. And the teachers of the law who came down from Jerusalem said, oh, he's possessed by Beelzebub or Baalzebul, by the prince of demons, he's driving out demons. Now, the idea from verse 20 is that Jesus was so popular that the people were crowding in on him and the disciples that they didn't even have time or room to eat. They were ministering too much. And according to John 7, 5, at the early point of Jesus' ministry, his own family didn't even believe in him yet at this time. 
They thought he was crazy for leaving a good, profitable trade. You're a tecton, you're a carpenter, you're a tradesman. What are you doing preaching and teaching the people? So much so that you can't even eat and you're doing it for free? You're, this is craziness. Now, people might think you're crazy for following Jesus, right? Why aren't you compromising on your taxes? Why aren't you uh, compromising at work? Why are you wasting your Sundays? Why do you read the Bible daily? Why do you tithe and put money in the bird box? Why are you so optimistic? Why not cheat, lie, steal, seek revenge, be selfish, speak meanly to others, take advantage to others? Why? I don't get it. Because I follow Jesus and I want to please him because I'm his minister and so are you. Take any area of compromise and get rid of it. It, 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 it makes, it drags you down. It makes him look bad. In verse 22, the leaders couldn't even deny the miracles Jesus was doing. And they were jealous of him. They were envious of him. So they told the people, Jesus was of Satan and not of God. Oh, it must be, he's of Satan. Now listen, how do I know that he was jealous? Well, even Pontius Pilate later on in, in Mark 15, 9 and 10 says, when he was trying to release either Barabbas or, or Jesus, he said, would you like me to release to you the king of the Jews, Pilate asked? And it says, for he realized by now that the leading priest had arrested Jesus out of jealousy or out of envy. They were saying that he was of Satan instead of of God. Now, who you believe Jesus is is of paramount importance. Lisa and I, the last time we, we uh, toured um, the footsteps of the apostles, uh, we sat, got to sit with uh, Josh McDowell, who's a Christian author, apologist, speaker, uh, him and his wife um, uh, in a little coffee bar on, in the ship. It was, I, I've literally given away thousands of his books. Uh, it was Okay, I, I don't, I, I'm no respecter of person. Everybody's the same to me, right? I, but it was Josh McDowell. <laughs> he, he wanted to send me a book. I'm so, I was so embarrassed. I, he said, oh, just, just put your na- address in the phone. <laughs> Josh McDowell. We're talking, we're sitting there coffee. We're sitting coffee with Josh McDowell and his wife. I... I couldn't remember my address. Finally, I, after a few minutes, I'm like, I'm like, I'm so, I can't, I'm, I, I'm, I, I'm never like this. I, anyway, but he said something very profound in, in the book, More Than a Carpenter. I've read it many times. Everybody should read this book. But it's a short, but as he said, to Jesus, who men and women believed him to be was of fundamental importance. He said to say what Jesus said and to claim what he claimed about himself, one could, couldn't conclude he was just a good moral man or a prophet. That alternative isn't open to an individual and Jesus never intended it to be. C.S. Lewis, who was a professor at Cambridge University and once an agnostic, understood this issue clearly. He writes... I am trying here to prevent anyone from saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I know this is long, but it's good. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level of a man who says he is a poached egg or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or a madman or something worse. Then Lewis adds, you can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. I've made my choice. You need to make yours. He goes on to say in Mark 3, 23 and 25, hey, is anybody, Pastor Gary, how long have I been teaching? Not long enough. Oh, boy. First, let me just say, that means absolutely nothing to me. I'm so sorry. I, I'm just going to keep teaching, and I'm sorry if I go over, okay? We're going to get through this. Mark chapter 3, 23 to 45 says, So Jesus called them over, and he began speaking to them in parables. And he said, How can Satan drive out Satan? 
If a kingdom is divided against itself, the kingdom can't stand, just like a house couldn't stand if it's divided. If a house is divided against itself, that house won't even be able to stand. Now, in Matthew's gospel, in Matthew 12, 22, Jesus says that the reason these Jewish leaders from Jerusalem were making these accusations was because Jesus just did a miracle within the crowd and he healed the demon-possessed man who was blind and mute, okay? And in Matthew chapter 12, 23, goes on to say, as a result of Jesus' authority over these demons and the miraculous healing he just did of this desperate man, right in front of their eyes, the people were saying literally, Matthew 12, 22 says, could it be Jesus is the son of David? He is the Christ. He is the Messiah we've been waiting for. And that's going to take people away from the Pharisees. They don't like that. They, you need to follow me. I'm a rock star. You need to go to this church. I'm a, anyway. Jesus exposed their bad hearts, bad theology, and bad logic by saying, in essence, why would Satan be overpowering him himself and making himself look weak and look bad? It, it doesn't even make sense. Why would he do that? It would just weaken himself so that he couldn't even stand. It doesn't even make sense. It goes on to say in Mark three twenty six to 27, If Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand. His end has come. In fact, it says, no one can enter a strong man's house without first tying him up. Then he can plunder the strong man's home. It's almost like Jesus is giving like a one verse parable here. Okay? And Jesus says, if Satan is opposing itself, then it's at war within itself and it's done for. It's like civil war. Here in this parable, the strong man is Satan and or his demonic forces. So Satan is powerfully, powerfully guards that which is his. And in this case, he was guarding the man who was possessed. Now, Jesus showed himself more powerful than the strong man, more powerful than the demon, more powerful than Satan and his forces by binding him. And in this case, setting the man free from the power of possession and healing him completely. Jesus looks at every life that's been delivered from sin, darkness, and Satan as plundering the strong man's house. Can I tell you what? I have been saved because Jesus bound up the strong man in my life and saved me. So the first thing we need to do, really, is we need to examine ourselves, right? And to see, are there any areas in our life that we are still allowing, even though we're saved, I'm opening a door for Satan to rule this one area, right? Bind him up in Jesus' name. Cut that sin off. It doesn't say just cut it off. It says cut it off, Jesus said, and throw it away. Get it away from you, far away from you, so that you don't go back to it. Lastly, as those who have been saved and set free and empowered by Jesus, I want you to remember something. Because you have been empowered, the Bible says the Holy Spirit has come to live inside of you and he's given you a strength and a power that you didn't have before. You're not the same person. If you're not feeling that power, it could be because you're allowing things in your life that you shouldn't be. But I want you to know that power is there. And anything that Satan or the demonic forces throw at you or this world throws at you, you can overcome them in Jesus' name. I guarantee it. Listen, it says in 1 John 4, 4, we went through the whole book of 1 John. It was awesome. It says, you, do you notice this picture? What do you see behind her as she's praying? See the cape? Anyway, you, dear children, are from God, and you have overcome them because, the Bible says, the one who is in you, the Holy Spirit, is greater than the one who is in the world. Isn't that awesome? He says also in 1 John 2, 13, he says, I'm writing you, young men or young women, because you've overcome the evil one, and you do that by the power of the Holy Spirit. Be strong in the Lord and his mighty power, not your mighty power. Your mighty power always loses or at least most of the time, but his power is an overcoming power. Romans 8.37 says we are more than conquerors. I know what a conqueror is, more than a conqueror. 
Or Philippians, I love this one. Philippians 4.13, this is the living Bible. This is how I feel sometimes. Maybe not you, but this is me, okay? But it says, for I can do all things or everything God asks me to do with the help of Christ, who gives me what? Strength and power. And we finish with these verses here, these last few verses. Mark chapter 3, 28 says, oh, sorry. Truly, I tell you, people can be forgiven all their sins. How many sins? And every slander they utter. And if you remember, we went over this scripture last week. It says, he canceled the record, the charge against us. God made you alive in Christ. He forgave you all your sins, Colossians 2, 13 to 14 says. But then Jesus goes on to say in Mark chapter 3, 29 to 30, he says, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. They are guilty of an eternal sin. And it says, he said this because they were saying he had an impure spirit. So we'll just leave it here. No, I'm not going to do that. I, I just, listen, folks have been very tormented about this verse for a long time. And I'm just going to keep it simple. Did I say something wrong? When I was younger, I said a bunch of dumb stuff. You know, even, I still say some dumb stuff. Ask my wife. She'll give you. But, but I, 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 did I say the wrong thing? Did I do the wrong thing? I, and and they, people are so tormented. And listen, um, I, that's why I at least want to mention this. It, this blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, what is it? What can it be? And, and just in short, the primary ministry of the Holy Spirit to the world is basically this. I've got summed it up into two verses. To convict the world of sin and of God's righteousness and of the coming judgment. So convict the world of sin, God's righteousness, and the coming judgment. That's in John 16, 8. It also says he's come to testify about who? Everything, it's all about Jesus, right? That's the Holy Spirit's mission, right? So to blaspheme against, that, against the Holy Spirit that these Pharisees and us, that, that Jesus is warning them about and he would warn us about is the settled rejection of the testimony of Jesus Christ. If the Holy Spirit's primary job is to testify about Jesus and you settle and you reject that in your heart, well, The Bible says that there's only one way to the Father, and that's through Jesus Christ. I I didn't write it. He did. John 14, 6. So to reject Jesus means you, by choice, can't be forgiven. Does that make sense? You are blaspheming. You are rejecting the whole purpose of the Spirit of God which is to testify about Jesus Christ. Uh, H.A. Ironside, which was a preacher and, and teacher, uh, he was a, for a theologian. Uh, he, he did Moody uh, Bible Institute for years. Moody Church, I should say. Said, these verses were never intended to torment anxious souls, honestly desiring to know Christ. This is a quote. But the verse stands out as a blazing beacon of warning on the danger of persisting in the rejection of the Holy Spirit's testimony of Christ until the seared conscience no longer responds to the gospel message. Something's happening as we're preaching and teaching. Your heart is even being softened or you're rejecting it. No, no, no. And once that gets to that point where you just say, you know what? I've made my decision. I am not, I am rejecting Jesus. That's all there is to it. Well, then you are also in danger of blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Can you bring a microphone to him? Oh, Oh, thank you. Uh, What do you think is the difference between a seared spirit and maybe a hardened heart? Okay, great question. I think a hardened heart can be softened by the oil of the Holy Spirit. And so I've watched the hard, sometimes really hard heart. I was a hard heart. I, I can... But a seared conscience, I don't know if you've ever seared a steak or something. You burned it until there's nothing there. It's like a branding iron. Do you, do you think that this only goes for people who have 
already knows who God was and then turns against him? I think, I think this warning, even like for the Pharisees, uh, listen, again, if you're rejecting him for a time, no, 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 because I was rejecting him for a time, right? But what he's talking about here, these Pharisees, they knew the scriptures inside and out. They, they had long settled and they had, they had seen miracles with their own eyes. They've experienced the, the paralyzed man getting up, demons being cast out, the word being taught with the power of the Holy Spirit. They knew all these things. They knew the prophecies about the Messiah. They knew that he fit all these qualifications. But how dare they take his position, away, people away from me? How, and you know what? No, we're going to kill him anyway. In fact, we're going to turn people against him. We're going to say he's of Satan. If that's their ending settled decision, you can't come back from that. Salvation, Acts 4.12 says, is found in no one else. There's no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. That name is? Jesus. That name is? Jesus. That name is? Jesus. Amen, brothers and sisters. Listen, the Bible says in 1 John 5.12, listen, if you want to go to heaven, if you want to be with him, Whoever has the Son, Jesus has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have eternal life. And he finishes with this, and it's almost like a, just an ending statement. Matthew, excuse me, Mark 3, 31 to 33 says, Then Jesus' mothers and brothers arrived, and standing outside, they sent someone to call him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they told him, Your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Who are my mothers and brothers, he said. And then he closes with this, Mark 3, 34 and 35. He says, and I just love this because it's so unique. Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him, all this hodgepodge of different people, different areas, socioeconomic backgrounds, whatever. Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. Listen, and then we'll close out with these scriptures. And if you want to know what God's will is, he said, whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. You know what God's will is? John 6, 40 tells us. Jesus even told us what it is. For it is my Father's will, he said. <laughs> Here it is. That all those who see the Son believe in him should have eternal life. That's his will. For you to believe the testimony about Jesus Christ and I will raise him up on the last day. And then in so doing, you will take what Jesus teaches you, and put it into practice. He who has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me, the Bible says. And Matthew 7, 24 says, anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock of Christ Jesus. And listen, there's a lot of things we can build our life on. As for me and my house, as best as I can, I want to serve the Lord. And so let's bow our heads and let's just pray. Father, if there's anyone here who needs a softening of their hearts, I pray that you would soften them, Lord. I can't do it. I ask that you would do it in Jesus' name by the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name if there are any hard hearted hearts, Lord, chip away, Lord. Chip away, chisel away at it, Lord, to get to the soft part underneath, Lord God. If there are any empty hearts, Lord, in Jesus' name, fill me up. Fill us up, Lord. Fill me up with your Holy Spirit, Lord. Let me change whatever pattern, help me to do things or not do things, whatever it is, Lord God, that I may sense your presence in your, my life, Lord God, and renew my heart, Lord. Give me clean hands and a pure heart, Lord God. Fill me with the right spirit, Lord God, your Holy Spirit, Lord God. Fill me afresh that I might overflow to others and bless this congregation, those who are here and those who are online, Lord God. Fill them up with your Holy Spirit, Lord. Don't let them leave today without taking a little piece of your presence home with them today, Lord God. I ask this, Lord God, in Jesus' name and all God's people together say, amen, amen, and amen. God bless you guys. Have a wonderful day in the name of Jesus.